Today's guest on the return episode of 10PATX Radio is Quentin Rosenweg. That's Q-U-E-N-T-I-N-R-O-S-E-N-Z-W-E-I-G. You can find him on Instagram by that same same name right there, that same spelling. And uh, he, you know, he goes by the heel hook hitman. Uh, one of the big big events that really kind of put him on the scene was our on it Invitational. Uh, he's gone on to win a bunch of other tournaments. He's in all the biggest tournaments at this time. He's consistently winning tournaments. He's consistently competing at a high level. And it was great to have him here in Austin for the last, uh, we had him in, we did this podcast last Monday and we had him in for about a week. And he's going to be back in November to get ready for the BJJ Fanatics tournament. Uh, He had the King of the Mat grappling tournament this weekend. I spoke with him about it, he said that he lost to Tex Johnson in the uh, in the semifinals uh, due to a knee bar. That he had been a little bit sloppy on the uh, on the entry for the for, uh, I believe he was going for a heel hook, and um, you know he just was felt like he was sloppy on the entry and ended up getting caught with a knee bar against an, again Tex Johnson's a really good competitor. So uh, Quentin, you know, he's now going to be a pretty frequent guest here at 10th Planet Austin. So it's going to be good to have him around, and this is a good way for you to get to know him. So you can follow me on you, me on Instagram at uh, Zach Moore NFL, Zach with a K, and you can follow me on Twitter if you like football. I talk about football stuff over there. And, um, you know, I'm going to be your host now on 10 PATX Radio, and we're going to make this a, a weekly show, and uh, there will be more to come. So uh, I hope you enjoy this episode with Quentin Rosenweg, and I hope you enjoy many more. <laughs> here we are for an episode of 10th Planet Radio, 10th, 10 PATX Radio. We're here with Quentin Rosenweg. He, he's been in town for the last week training for, what, what's the competition this weekend? Uh, it's King of the Mat. I was supposed to have Gordon Ryan first round, but uh, he pulled out. And maybe pink guy, maybe, maybe my knee's hurting a little, I don't know. Maybe, maybe he heard about the leg locks. I don't know. I mean, for me, the biggest thing is, like, if he wasn't 100%, I want to face him when he's 100%. Like, you don't want to take the best guy out when he's not at his top. Like you want yeah. to show that you're better than what he could be at his best day. So, whatever. Hopefully, I'll see him in BJJ Fanatics tournament in November if he does it. The 10K, so I should draw him out. 10K championship. So absolute. Yeah, King of the Mats 10K also. So Are these all absolutes that you're going after right now? Uh, yeah. I've always kind of been into the absolutes. Big guys are easy to pick on, and uh, it's just a little bit more fun sometimes. With your with your leg entries, I feel like the quickness and speed with which you, with you with with which you attack legs, um, kind of kind of makes your game something that tra- can translate over into absolute. Where not all styles of play probably yeah, because it's hard to play in those long games with those big guys, especially if you're like if you're a wrestling based style and like you had to face some of those really big guys. That, like having a big guy just lean on you for that long yeah. is tiring. If I can knock him out quick, like take a leg home in a few seconds, that's no energy for me. It's like stretching. <laughs> and that that reminds me of uh, what happened across the street on an Invitational 10, right? Mm-hmm. That was the one um, at our old location, the last on Invitational we've had, um, but we're hoping to have another one coming on um, in, I believe it's going to be January. But you took out, uh, you won, what was it, three straight matches and all were under, well, the first two were that quick. And then, you know, the last one, Kyle Bone was like a minute and 40 seconds. Yeah, they were all like under under two minutes for sure. Uh, yeah, that's just my style, man. I, I play to where people are weak. And usually people are weak at the ankles. So if they give me opportunities, I take them. A lot of people still don't understand like the entanglements and like the intricacies of like how triangles work and how like that shallow like cross works or the different kinds of angles you can cut with it. Like there, there's some people catching on now. Like you'll see like a Lachlan Giles is playing more of that style. Uh, it's gonna be like the next wave of jujitsu. Is this new style of playing angles on the legs, but the various angles that you can play based on the triangles that you're forming, yeah, your, le- like, your leg control. There's a lot of people that still think like Ashi 411 and 5050 are like all your leg lock positioning. That's not. There's like a million now. There's all these little slight angles, slight adjustments, slight ways people play. Or you have like that Captain Morgan and all this new like nomenclature for some stuff. Stuff I don't even know. It's the stuff I was like, oh yeah, I do that. But it's interesting. So that's the next evolution of some of this leg stuff that kind of is kind of where. Yeah, you're it's at. a continuation of angles. So, like I always refer back to this. 
uh, there was a Fudo Videos rolled up episode with Brawler with Steamo, where we would talk about like the gray areas of Jiu Jitsu. What's happening is those gray areas, like those unmapped areas, are starting to get mapped. It's like, it's like kind of yeah. like mapping out the world. Yeah, like yeah, you yeah. kind of discover a little more at a time, and the map, picture. map yeah. continues to grow. And that, that's what's happening in the leg entanglements. Like you have your maps and your sequences up top, and like people are always adding to them, but there's still so much growth to happen in leg entanglements, people don't even understand. Because, yeah, they're people, yeah, people are still catching up to like uh, the normal leg lock stuff from like a few years ago, like where Eddie Cummings yeah. was. Yeah. And he's even way ahead of it now. Is like the short and cut angles on the knees, but yeah, there's still people like ripping across the body. Like, if you're ripping across the body, you're way behind. You need to book a seminar with me. <laughs> well, it reminds me of you know my my specialty is football, and uh, when people have an idea, then other people carry it along. But there's only certain people that can actually build on that idea. Yeah, and there's for people sure. who are just copying the ideas of the people who actually created the idea that are now even further ahead because like you're doing, you're you're creating new angles, and what we've seen with with you, working with you this week is that just the the knowledge of uh, the legs and those angles ha has been a, something that we're all becoming more cognizant of now after seeing you do it. Oh yeah, you have to. Because like as soon as you get a tattoo with it a few times in a row, you're like, all right, what's happening here? Yeah. And that's really like that's almost been my strategy for how I get into new areas to do seminars and stuff like that. Is I just guerrilla market. I go in, I leg lock everybody. And then they're like, okay, how'd you do that? And it's how I've broken into almost every market that I've taught seminars in. Just like go in, lay waste with a smile and, and continue to teach. Yeah. And hopefully I get booked for a lot more stuff. Yeah, I mean, it, it's been, I mean, all week. Uh, you know, you, we went to we went to Cooper's MMA yesterday as well. I, I mean, the way you've talked about it as well, um, we were just talking about it in the car, is that you have a confidence about yourself with your, with your jiu-jitsu at this point. And I think it's a, become this earned confidence where you've gone in and you've gone into all these places and you've, you've rolled with all these people, whether it's in a big event or in practice, and you're seeing the stuff you're doing works against a wide variety, of, which gives you this confidence that you can just feel in, in talking to you. Yeah, I mean, I just think it's like a logical sense of things. So like, I, there are guys that are very good, there are guys that can beat me, I know that. But I know on my best day I could beat anybody in the world. So I assume every day I prepare to be on my best day. If I do that, then no one's gonna last more than 30 seconds. Like you've seen it, anyone I roll with, like if I'm on point, you're done. Yeah. You end up on an Instagram highlight. Yeah, and that and, and that becomes an issue for you too, is that you, your, your fights are essentially like, uh, from a marketing perspective as well, your fights are, uh, and from, a, from a fear perspective of this dude can finish, we can, we can slap hands and it can be over, and he can have his hand raised all in one Instagram video. And yeah, I mean, that's why I have to go up in weight classes to find matches. Yeah, it's when hard. you when you won the thing across the street, you're only 185 pounds, right? I yeah. think I weighed in at 184 for that 205 thing. Yeah. Like if you check. Uh, yeah, I just never really cared about weight. I used to try to cut a lot of weight. Like I tried to fight MMA at 170, and I would just kill myself making it. I feel like I looked like a Holocaust victim. And I remember I would cut like 15 pounds in the sauna to make 172 yeah. with like the two pound allowance for amateurs. And I'd be like, God, I feel like death. And then I got into jiu-jitsu and I was still cutting some weight. And finally one day I was like, I was just rolling with somebody and someone when I was training weight gave me trouble. And like I wasn't training weight and I just mauled them. Yeah. And I was like, oh snap, maybe, maybe I shouldn't cut weight anymore. And then I just I started doing a lot of absolute tournaments and I would maul guys that I would be like scared of when I see them. I'd be like, that's a big dude. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and, uh, and then I'd be like, oh snap, I think I just broke that guy's leg. I feel really bad, but that's kind of cool. How many how many legs do you think you've broken? <laughs> uh, I don't know. Man. It's such a crazy thing to ask somebody because like that like like you're, actually you're, broken not yeah. that many like torn stuff a lot because uh, like when you break a leg like there's there's a video that I have on my Instagram where I was rolling with this guy in the ADCC trials when they were in Anaheim a few years ago and I think it's from Grace Baja. And I, I rolled in on the outside heel, I put it on once, it popped, and I thought the guy was gonna tap and let go. And he came in again, I put on the same one, and this time, I didn't let go. And you just hear his tib fib pop, and it sounds like a freaking gunshot going off. It goes boom, boom. Like, so you know when you pop someone's bone. Uh, so, legs broken, like, maybe two or three. Like, the legs wrecked from other stuff, like, man. 
don't know. The video <laughs> it's I just a long jiu-jitsu career. The, uh, the video I just saw this morning from the Ana Invitational was uh, you could hear the two pops of uh, on Skull. Skull I, maybe Skull was watching with you this Oh, morning. I forgot about that one, too. Yeah. No, he wasn't watching it with me. I saw he posted it up, though. Yeah. Uh, I think that guy's name was Reed, Reed Schlinger. I don't know. Really nice guy. I felt really bad his kids were there. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> Doing in front of someone's kids is always... Man, that's why I stopped doing like Naga tournaments and stuff. Like the last right. one I went to, I was in like the finals with this like 35 year old guy and his kid was watching. And I almost put him to sleep in a triangle and his kid starts like tearing up and I'm like, I just hold him there for a second. I'm like, and he taps, I'm like, oh God. I was like, if that kid would have started crying, I would have like lost my shit. <laughs> and you have, a, you have a long history of competition, uh, of wrestling, right? Which, uh, which is I also wrestled because you. of Jiu Jitsu. Okay. So okay. when I was, when I started Jiu Jitsu, I was like 15. And I asked my jiu-jitsu coach, I was like, do you think I should do wrestling to like make my jiu-jitsu better? And I did, and honestly, the only thing I really took away with, from it was like the wrestling grind mentality and the ability to have like a good single leg. Yeah. Like that, that's, that's what I got from that. Uh, and then like I kind of pulled away from wrestling for a bit. I played football while I was still doing all this stuff. Uh, but jiu-jitsu was linebacker. a little my love. Yeah, I was a linebacker. Took, took a few concussions in the day. Uh, <laughs> Quite a few. Yeah, we honestly, all. I can't even watch football now. Like, that's all I think about is like the CTE stuff. Like, I know a bunch of guys that got punched drunk doing MMA, yeah. and it just freaks me out. Like, just to watch their senses dull. Because, like, I like to crack jokes and be like a funny wise guy sometimes. I can imagine not having like the cognitive functions to do that. Yeah, yeah, Ugh. yeah. I get a, I get more and more um, uh, concerned with head trauma every year. Honestly, like, if you want my opinion, I think they should take the pads and the helmets away. I think you'd have less head trauma. Yeah. You'd have more other injuries, but at least they'd be able to think. Yeah, who knows, though? I mean, because there's less head trauma incidences in rugby. Who knows how you get the, get to the NFL to that point, though? Oh. Because then it's no longer. That's that's the thing. is that We all know that that's probably, right, the solution or something to it. Because a lot of dudes use that helmet. As, yeah, the and, and, try spear tackling with your bare head. Yeah, and 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 like the thing about that is, it there there might be a fifteen yard penalty for it, but it still happens once a game. Oh, at least and, you know it's still it's like it's like once every other play. Yeah, I mean, and then and then it, it changes the blocking and stuff if you don't have pads. So, still can be a violent game, but like the thing is, is that that crack, that sound, that it, that violence, um, you know, it's part of why people watch it and part of why. People yeah, but watch don't you think? To add the expression of someone like struggling and going through something really adds something special to the game. Like if you were playing football and you could see like the face of like the linemen pushing into each other. I think that like adds something to the human characteristics of it. And at least allows you to appreciate it. Like I think that's one of the visceral feelings of rugby, why it's so like world renowned for like the game it is, is that like you can connect with those people. You can see the emotion on their face. You can I see feel like a lot of times players. Yeah, and I feel I feel like a lot of times with football you don't get that. No, you, you don't, don't have that Ricky know, Williams seen. effect where he's hiding behind the visor. Yeah, Ricky Williams looked like a gangster back then with the visor. Yeah, but he was doing it because he was scary. Yeah, he was. <laughs> like when I saw that anxiety. 30 for 30, I felt so bad for that dude. Yeah, he uh, and he was like 15 years ahead of his time talking about weed and stuff. Oh yeah, and he was doing just... yoga and stretching, like talking about movement. And you could see when he would run. The thing is, is he just tried to carry too many shitty teams. Well, he had he had one season with the Dolphins the year before he took off, where he didn't have a great season statistically either, like in terms of like his yards per carry. Really big important stat for a running back, right? He had a lot of yards, but he had like three point seven yards per carry or something like that, which isn't great. Because they were running him like every down. Because he ran the ball like three hundred and sixty times or something, yeah. <laughs> some stupid. And uh, then he had 50, 50 catches and seventy targets, and then all the times that he passed block. So he got hit like five hundred and fifty times that season or something. Yeah, something, you're right? talking about maybe arguably one of the best running backs that like never really made it. Like, they never really, really became that dude. Yeah, yeah. Like Barry Sanders was that dude and never really made it. Imagine how good that guy would have been. Well, if he played a few more years. Not even if he played a few more years. Oh, if he played on a team that could actually block for him. Yeah, yeah. Holy shit. Yeah, he he still had great stats, but not what he could have been. And that's one thing. He would have been the best running back ever, bar like without question. Yeah, yeah, you know, like because because right now it's it's still a debate. It wouldn't have been a debate if, no. if he was on the Dallas Cowboys. The way his movement, the way he would just slip past people, it was like yeah. effortless. It was like yeah. watching the Matrix before that movie ever came yeah. out. Yeah, I used to just watch his highlights today, like pumped up to like go to football practice. <laughs> he was. Um, I mean, well, that's 
that's part of the thing I always try to communicate about football is that like there's so many variables that go into a player's success. So it's like, and that's something that I really like about jujitsu is that, you know, it's just you. Like it's just like there's there's you, the coaching you get, and yeah, what you put I, in. I will say like I took a, away a lot of uh, coaching aspects from football. There's a lot of really good coaches that have made their way through football, like the other Vince Lombardi's and stuff like that. And like jujitsu is still in those aspects where it was like more of a taekwondo yeah. kind of thing. And I think adding a proper coaching aspect uh, really changes the game. But like, yeah, some of the stuff I took away from football, like I remember we would sit down and we have these meetings before games and like they would feed you and you sit down and you guys would come yeah, talk. Yeah. And I remember our head football coach once just shouting at us, this big ball guy, his name was Shane Sweeney. And uh, he was just saying, he's like, fake it till you make it. He's like, find out what the best people in your field are doing and imitate what they do until it becomes yeah. what part of you. Yeah. And I think this is kind of like the attitude that I adopted in almost everything I did in jujitsu. Like I would just start doing stuff and then I'd start innovating it because I had done it so much that I'd known all the angles, I'd known how stuff was gonna work out. So it made it really easy for me. Yeah. And then I just now apply that aspect to all parts of my jujitsu game. Like if I like when I started adding more wrestling back to my game, uh, I found a wrestling club. I started going in with old vets, have to get beat up and like beat around by these old guys. And then you start beating them, and then you start showing up when the D1 guys are there, and they start beating the crap out of you. And then maybe you get like one nice thing on them, and then you start like beating them with the awkward funky jujitsu stuff, you know? So you kind of blend the two, and it it makes it better. Like everything you do, like that's what I'm like moving forward in like business aspect and trying to figure out where I'm gonna move or if I'm gonna open a school or if I'm just gonna continue to keep traveling and teach seminars all over the world for a while while I can and ex experience everything. Like I just, I, I don't kind of know, but in the process of doing it and learning what I wanna do. Yeah. And it, it's allowing me to evolve and evolve the way I think about it. Yeah. Yeah, I was, uh, when you say fake it till you make it, like who are, like um, when you're, who are you faking in jujitsu? Who did you fake the most? You hear, you hear comedian on the podcast that I'm, I listen to, and I, I would imagine some of the guys you listen to too. Is you hear about the comedians that are talking about like the guys who like they all like some some guys when they started out in New York sound like Dave Attell or they sound like um, you know so and so because they that's who they looked up to, so that's who they modeled their game after, and then they became their own thing after that. Yeah, I mean, there's some definite ones. Like, obviously, Eddie, because I like being flexible and uh, playing with my legs. <laughs> and uh, then, like, Eddie Cummings was always, like, somebody I try to, like, imitate his game because you, you're like, oh, yeah, you got to really, like, enjoy the efficient beauty that is the violence that Eddie puts on somebody, like, with his leg locks. Uh, and I, I think that was a big inspiration. Let's see, who else? What do you Leo see as, what do you see as efficiency in um, leg locks? Can you, can you explain that point? Yeah, so like, this is where you see a lot of people lose leg locks, is the leg lock doesn't matter as much for the grip up top or the finishing there. Uh, That's more of a securing position. <clears throat> if you're worried about pulling on that, you've already got a pretty shitty leg lock. Uh, what you want to do is you want to be able to lock something in. So if you can secure a position, you have a leg lock because you have isolation. If I can isolate, I can break. So if I can implement the strongest parts of my body, like my hips and my legs, into my breaking mechanics, I make it there more, therefore so much stronger. Like I'm gonna tear through everything. Like yeah. If I hit like my proper like you're not just gonna double outside of the hip on there. I'm gonna yeah. I'm gonna snap through your tib and fib. Like if I put a heel lock on there, your ACL's gone. Like I don't leave room for error. Like yeah. having faced like some big guys where like you have to be on your point and you have to be strong in those positions, or otherwise they'll just take a little pop on their ankle. Like you better make sure you make those adjustments, otherwise you're not gonna beat them. And. Uh, that's something else, like just adding strength and conditioning to your game. Man, like I've been doing, I told you like the 4.30 a.m. Yeah. wake-ups, and it just, it builds a different mentality. Again, that's something else, like you talk about the fake it till you make it. I watched a Kobe Bryant interview when he talked yeah. about how he'd wake up every morning. I think he was doing like 3.30, just so he could get those extra hours in training and the rest to be able to keep competing. So that way he'd be ahead of everyone else on the amount yeah. of work he would put in. Like that's the kind of ideology that you have to have. Like you have to have that mentality that like, I don't care what it takes, this is what it takes to be a champion, and I'm gonna fucking do it. Like I don't care if it means I hurt all the time, I don't care if it means I'm tired, I don't care if it means like I'm sweaty in some like, somebody's basement, because I have to like train somewhere that I'm like yeah. crazy. Like yeah. <laughs> if I, I had to train staying at the fighter house in, uh, in Toledo, Ohio, like 
it's a fighter house. Like it's a mattress on the floor in the basement. It was really cool. Like you got that like Spartan mentality lifestyle. So like, but yeah, that's another thing. Like the ability to like drop in places. I really like like dropping into different pockets and microcosms of jujitsu and just experiencing life in jujitsu through all these different people's eyes and seeing the way they view the world and the way they view their jiu-jitsu. And how they live there. And how, how their lives have like influenced their jujitsu journey through like injuries or like what they like to do or if they wrestled in high school or where they wrestled because some people are big upper body wrestlers, some are lower body, some are real like scrambly wrestlers so that influences their jujitsu more or people that were like gymnasts. Like it's really crazy. Yeah. yeah. But, and you've gotten to experience like you know, you just, oh, yeah, just I think it's made my jiu-jitsu better. Yeah, I, I, I went and saw Ken Peters in Nova Scotia. Amazing human. If you ever have a chance to go to Nova Scotia, I highly recommend you do it. It's gorgeous. The seafood's delicious, and they like to drink a lot of beer. Uh, <laughs> pretty good beer, too, I will say. Uh, and Ken's just a delightful human. Like, he's a really good dude. Had he a seems blast to be a with him. great businessman, and that's partially due to him being such a good guy. Yeah. Too. That's the thing is, like, in this industry, especially early on, there were so many guys that just, like, they were not stand-up guys. Like they're yeah. like, oh, you gotta watch out for this guy or this guy. And Ken's just one of the guys. Who, like he's a man of his word. He says he's gonna do what he's gonna do. Uh, he'll stand by his beliefs, and I applaud that. Like there's a lot of guys who flip flop back and forth on the people they even like in jujitsu. And so, like, if I like you, you know I like you. If I don't like you, you know I don't like you. And I don't flip flop back and forth. And Ken's that kind of dude too. So, yeah. Love people. <laughs> yeah. The. Um, the the ex seminar experiences that you're getting right now. You're trying to go to Europe right now? Yeah. So trying to book something in Europe? Uh, where do you well, want, are you, are you at the point right now where you're, you're trying to decide where do I want to go visit? And let's it's see not even like where I want to go visit. I want to visit everywhere, man. Yeah. Like life is all about the experiences. Like the thing I've noticed, like having, like I had a, it was a pretty tough year. Like my dad passed away in February and that was rough. And then like this whole thing with my gym split, the gym that I was at for like half my life. When I started yeah. jujitsu, and uh, literally half your life, like yeah, year, years wise, yeah, yeah, literally half my life. Uh, so but most of the time, it's kind of just left me at this place where I'm like, I just want to kind of like experience life and experience the world. Like I, I still want to be the best rapper alive, and it consumes me every day. But like, if I can see and experience the world and experience people, and like really get to, to view everything, I think that's that's all part of living, like living the best life that you can. Do you feel like... Uh, I feel like it makes me a better person. Yeah, well, for sure. Because it, it, you get these different scopes on you. things. Well, I feel like what you just said about, um, you know, being in a gym for half your life is it reminds me of when I was done playing football. I was like, man, there's all this other shit I can do that isn't football. Because, like, my whole life has just been, like, football. But you're not... It's not like you're going to slow down in the jiu-jitsu. Oh, but you're like, dude, I, I can't even tell you current events right now. Yeah. Like, if you ask me anything really political, like, I can give you an opinion, but I don't know anything. Like I don't, and my world doesn't exist outside of jujitsu, really. Yeah. Like it's all I do. Like I hang out with people that do jujitsu, and yeah. I do jujitsu. Yeah. Like I like listening to music. I'll go to concerts every once in a while. I like stand up comedy. I hope to give that a shot one day. Uh, but my life is jujitsu right now, and like I, I like it. I like being a jujitsu gypsy. I like dropping into places, just experience it. Like even the places that like aren't like the places you would think to drop into. Like you're going to Ohio next week. Yeah, people wouldn't think to go to Ohio in jujitsu, but you're gonna get. Well, some I mean, the thing about Ohio, the beautiful thing about Ohio, uh, besides like the farmland, which is cool, like seeing like the sunrise. Like I saw some seminars out there, and like driving, you see the sunrise over the farms, and it's gorgeous. Uh, is the people? The people in Ohio have this weird friendliness to them, where everyone like kind of wants to be your friend. They're all very polite, uh, and I, I think that's where the beauty lies in Ohio, is the people. Except for like in the methy places, but even those people are really nice. Like but, <laughs> Chappelle, Chappelle with the, is out living in uh, the country in Ohio. Why he has a bunch of guns? Do you see it in the special? Well, the thing is, is there's <laughs> such diversity in Ohio too. Like it's a very like mixed hodgepodge like state. Like you have all kinds of ethnic backgrounds. I, I, haven't, I haven't even ever been to Ohio. Oh, I've been all over now. Like well, Columbus. I've been to Columbus. I've been to Toledo. I've been to Cleveland. I've driven up through near Cincinnati. I've driven through, that's it, that's it. Yeah, but Ohio's a cool state, man. Like I said, all the people are great there. Like my buddy Dante's out there, him, Gutenberg Ferreira, uh, Leo Silva, that GF team, Toledo. I went and trained with them, like had a great time. It's an amazing place to train if you're in Ohio, I highly recommend Where it. Where is it? 
Uh, it's in Toledo. Toledo? Okay. Yeah. I also trained at GF Team Columbus, which was a really cool facility too, really nice. Um, Laura Halleck and what's his name? Jake McKenzie. They were super cool. And uh, yeah, and then my buddy Emil Fisher is in Cleveland. Uh, he's a good friend of mine. He's also a writer for Jiu Jitsu Times. So if you're in Cleveland, check out Emil. Awesome dude. Now, what, um, now you're, you're talking about relocating and what, what are you like looking for in a place right now? What are you looking, like you've been saying you're trying to figure out what's next, like wh wh where, what do you think, what direction do you think you're going in? I honestly have no idea. I'm kind of just like floating in the state of being like a Jiu Jitsu Gypsy. Like I'm making the money I need uh, and stuff like that. But uh, like I really like Texas, it's really cool out here. Everyone here is amazing. Uh, looking into Charleston also, uh, I have an opportunity there. I've always kind of been in love with Savannah, so maybe I'll end up there. But I don't even know. Like even when I was in Nova Scotia, I was like, oh, maybe I'll live here. But then I thought about the winters, and I was like, I, I can't do winter. It's already cold there. Yeah. Uh, there's some talking about some stuff in Florida too. I was talking to Curtis about, so I'm gonna check that out. Florida's all right, but I feel like to live nice in Florida, you need a lot of money, so it takes a lot of money for me to go out there. Um, but yeah, I, re I really just don't know. Kind of just waiting for an epiphanous moment to hit me, like, in the direction of going. Well, you're going to have the chance to do that with all the traveling you're doing. Oh, yeah. And get, get what to what you were saying about seeing the whole world, um, and that you're going here, you're going there, like, eventually something's going to happen in one of these places that's like, this is what I'm, well, this is what I think I need to do. Yeah, and it's funny, as I feel like, I feel like this is being, like, a cliche thing in jiu-jitsu, where these guys, like, you get released from a team, or, like, the separation happens, and you go through these, like, Oh, where are they gonna end up kind of thing and really I just think it takes time like it's a big thing like leaving a team that I was with forever basically like luckily I had the dual affiliation with 10th planet so like I always felt like I had a home and 10th planet's been my homies for a while now like even before I joined uh, they were always super cool to me and the people that supported me uh, when my own team even did it like Brandon McCatherine coached me at the Honor Invitational and I wasn't even 10th planet then yeah. Like, I think the only one he didn't was when I asked Kyle Bain, and I don't think he coached Kyle either. So, like, so you've so known... Record, I, I realize that respect that they have for for the game. You've known BMAC for a while, right? Uh, yeah, so I competed against BMAC twice uh, at the Kakuto Invitationals, and I armbarred him twice. And every time, he just gave me a big hug. Every time he'd see me, he asked me how I was doing and stuff like that. And I was friends with Applegate and Chase and those guys, and, like, had matches with Chase and Josh and all them, like, back and forth stuff. And they were always great competitors and the sweetest humans ever. So, uh, and Eddie Bravo was actually like my first seminar. So, <laughs> it just kind of made sense. Like I had talked with Eddie a bunch, and I decided to make the decision to do Tenth Planet because um, I like I needed a big team that actually supported me. And I didn't even realize how much they supported me until after like all that stuff happened with my other team, and they kind of like kind of let me go because of ego stuff. Uh, but it's cool. Yeah, my 10th yeah. planet family. Now I'm just trying to figure out where I want to like set up home base. I guess if I want to set up home base, or it, when. Yeah. Maybe, if not, probably not if, but when you'll eventually come to that like, right? I mean, that's the thing. Is like, I, I don't know if I. I don't know if I ever will. It's funny because <laughs> I think I will because like cause the, a month getting, ago, getting traveling yeah. and stuff like that, like like trying to find a place where you're like, oh, like this is where I'm gonna spend probably the rest of my life doing. Like there's places I fucking love, but like it's hard to pin it down. I also like I don't know when I'm gonna be this free again to like do the things that I'm no, doing or see yeah. the things that I'm seeing. Like I'm living a life most people like dream about. Yeah, yeah. Like and when you I, do be it, this free I do again? it because yeah. I, I dedicated my life to jujitsu. I sacrificed a yeah. lot to be here. Uh, so like I, you kind of gotta enjoy that a bit too, I guess. Yeah, because I mean to your point, like when are you gonna be this free again? It's like enough. Like, I don't know, man, never. Like, you're 28 years old, right? Yeah, so yeah. that's why, like, finding a gym eventually will definitely be a thing. And uh, I'm just ready for the next competitions, too. Like I said, that BJJ Fanatics tournament, like, that should be fun. Uh, I think that's somewhere they want me to film a DVD, which has always been, like, a dream of mine, filming a Jiu-Jitsu DVD. So that's real cool. Uh, I'll be on Rockfin here soon. And uh, so, like, a lot of my Jiu-Jitsu technique will be libraried on there. Uh, keep an eye out for it. I'll have it on my Instagram at Quentin Rosenzweig. Uh, if you're interested in my technique, I think I have a very different approach and view 
the leg locks than most people and a lot of jiu-jitsu than most people. And uh, that, that's another thing that drove me to the planet was the, the ability to be creative and, and to, uh, to be applauded for being creative. Yeah, and th there's something interesting about watching you teach and recognizing, um, so Eddie just came last month right after you came through for the, um, the Texas Nogi Summit. Eddie came through and it's like the fourth, fifth, whatever time I met him and he was going over you know the most important position to be in like for instance like the red zone in football mm -hmm. right like the back is a, the red zone like if you're an offense if, if in football the red zone is when the offense is within the 20 yards that lead into the opponent's end zone so for this metaphor the red zone in these positions are the most important positions that lead to submissions and the back um, the spider web and then the other one is truck Right, so Eddie kind of created, in his opinion, Eddie kind of created his three, these three kind of red zone positions, and just listening to him talk about that, knowing that he set up, that he's kind of innovated in terms of rubber guard, and he's innovated in terms of lockdown, and then watching you teach some of the leg stuff, it's clear that you're an innovator, and you're kind of, you've, you're creating your own system that now, kind of through the process of the DVDs that you're going to create and the content you're going to produce over the next few years, you're going to kind of systemize that into your own style of this created that now adds to the whole system that we all get to learn from because what you're learning and then the network that we have of 10th planet all these kind of ideas spread around you're you're kind of like our our if there's an offensive coordinator there's a defensive coordinator you're like you're like our leg lock coordinator <laughs> like so it's kind of like watching you do this I'm realizing that what you know is now going to improve everyone it's going to improve the whole game of the people here and then the people across the spectrum that are going to continue to learn from the seminars you well, teach. And I mean, even like my stuff, it's all like influenced by other people too. Like, yeah. Like some of my things that like I've built into stuff now is influenced by like Joe Bays and Joshua Duke. Like some of the stuff I've learned was influenced by Marvin even. Yeah. Uh, or Sean Applegate. Yeah. Marvin's great. Marvin's, Marvin's Yeah. It's like, and if you guys don't know Sean Applegate, like he's probably one of the better coaches in the sport. Like that dude's good. Have him in for a seminar also. Uh, but yeah, no, like there's been tons of influences. Josh Hayden was an influence of mine. Uh, like I said, Eddie Cummings. Yeah, well, who, uh, cause I stopped you to, to get a, to, to expand on something you said. Um, who else, who else were you faking um, from a, from a jujitsu standpoint? And then even who else were you, are you faking from a business standpoint now that you're kind of on this, like who, are, who do you look up to in terms of what you're trying to accomplish in this journey you're on of trying to figure out where you're gonna land? I don't know. I feel like on this journey, like the business side, I've always like, I learned some really good sales stuff, like working at the gym I was at. Like, yeah. I know how to talk to people. I know how to relate if I need to. Um, so that was never super hard. And most of the time, like, as long as you're a cool dude, people are going to want to do business with you. Yeah. Like Ben Saunders put a thing up today. It was like, be nice or be a nice human. And like, if you're a nice human to people, like usually they're nice back to you. So like, as long as like I'm cool with people, I try to do the right thing and be nice to them. Like, I think it'll always work out for me. And I think I'm intelligent enough that it's always gonna work out for me yeah. too. Um, so, I never really like- And you have a skill set. Yeah, like once you realize that you have like a unique skill set, yeah. like the way you think isn't the way everyone else thinks. Cause I feel like a lot of times we get trapped in these like idea bubbles where we're like, this is the only way to do something. And right. anything outside of this is ridiculous. Like people got trapped in like the Don Herr bubble for a while, which like, Don is a great instructor, has some good stuff to say and stuff like that. But you shouldn't accept anyone's rule, like anyone's word as law. Well. Like there's always new ways to create to do stuff. Like being creative in jujitsu is one of the beautiful things, and it takes a long time to be able to do it. Like you can be a little creative early on, and like little belts, little stuff here and there, but to just change the way you do everything, like it takes a lot. Yeah. So like once you get those black belt years, and now we're gonna have so many black belts coming up. Like yeah. You got the Tackett brothers. Like those guys are trying to change the game too. Like you can just tell they radiate jujitsu. Uh, it, like it's pretty cool to see like those Vitolo twins, like those guys are nasty. Even like Nicky Ryan, like this next generation like, is gonna completely change the way Jiu Jitsu is done. Just like the previous generation did and the previous generation before that. Like, it's, like I said, it's all those gray areas getting mapped out. There's gonna be a million ways to, to cook an egg. It's gonna be yeah. which one you choose. The cool thing that I like about Jiu Jitsu is that the coaches are also still practicing, because in football, the yeah, coaches I mean, are out of the game. Obviously you still have coaches that can, are still excellent coaches that can't practice them. Like, right, like Donner. Yeah. Well, I mean, I, like I've seen videos of Donner rolling too, and he was still good rolling. Like, yeah. He can roll with like GSP back in the day, I'm like, oh, the fighter. But, 
Yeah. Like, if you can roll, that's cool. Yeah. It's definitely a benefit, but if you build a stable, you don't have to. Right, right, right. Like, look at one of the best teams ever. Carlson Gracie, right? You had Ricardo Arona, like, Ducao, uh, who else was in there? Merlo Bustamante was there, right? I don't know. I don't know. You're, you're, you're the jiu jitsu historian. Yeah, Vitor history. Belfort. Yeah. Like, Jesus. Like, that guy didn't have to roll. Like, Carlson didn't have to roll. Those guys knew jiu jitsu because of him and could carry on everything he taught by doing it. Like, I hopefully I can roll till the day I die. I probably yeah. will because I'm insane. I'll probably die on a jiu jitsu mat. <laughs> but, uh, yeah. Like, as long as you have this love of jiu jitsu in your head, this idea and concept of how it works and how the leverage works, it could still be there. Right. Like we were talking about the other day about mental reps. I think men mental reps are a big thing. Yeah. I get lost in my head doing mental reps all the time, and it's actually usually how I figure out new techniques. Because I'm like, I wonder what would happen if I just did this. And then I play it through in my head. I'm like, well, the knee will start going this way. We were literally doing it at the pro house before I got here. Like I was playing around with uh, Christian. I was like, Christian, what if I do this? And we figure out this cool way to take the back, which we took a video of. It should be up later. Uh, I just have to edit out Skull being crazy, but <laughs> besides that, the video should be up. Uh, but yeah, a lot of it's just having fun, man. Like if you can have fun with jujitsu, like and, and it really allows you to truly be an artist with it. When you become an artist with it, it allows you to work at it in a different way, in a different view than other people. Like uh, I always use the expression like the Muhammad Ali. Like traditionally, a lot of stuff Muhammad Ali did, or even Roy Jones did as a boxer, is wrong, very wrong but they found the ways to make it right. And there's ways in jujitsu of doing that. Like there's stuff that someone could tell you is wrong, but you can find a way to make it right. A standing heel look is wrong. I found a way to make it right. Yeah, and you taught it to us. That's the thing you taught us the other yeah. day. Which works and is like a pretty violent lock too. Yeah, the thing is, is you just have to find the logical solution that makes it work. Like if you can make mechanics, you can make something work. You just have to understand the mechanics of how things work and how the defenses of things work. Yeah, it's clear that you understand the mechanics of heel hooks on a level that, that, oh, yeah. that almost no one else. I, I, I would imagine. No, there's that, other people that know. Yeah. There's just not a lot of us. Like, there's some that kind of know, and then there's some that kind of knew for a while, and then there's, there's the top level right now. And, like, if you're talking leg locks, like, I'd put myself up there on the top level. You talk top five right now, I'd say that. Yeah. I, I'd argue for number one, but we'll see. What, what, uh, what do you have coming up in terms of competitions? Right now, because I, I, I mean, I, I think you're 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 shooting to to prove that you are number one over over these next few months. I would imagine. Yeah, I, I would imagine that these are continuing. The thing to grow. is, is it, it really doesn't matter that much about the number one thing. I want to be the best version of myself that I can be. Yeah. And I think me being the best version of myself is me being the best in the world. And I think at this point, I think I could prove I'm the best in the world. I think the way I've been performing lately, the way I've been rolling. Like, I just don't think there's going to be anything that can stop me. And I think I'm going to do what I want. I think I'm going to take what I want. And I think I'm going to break everything along the way if anyone tries to stop me. Yeah. What do you have, what do you have coming up? I have King of the Mat. Uh, this coming up Saturday in Cleveland. So I'll be there. That'll be October 19th. And then I'm doing the BJJ Fanatics Tournament November 15th. And if anybody wants any super fights along the way, hit me up too. Uh, I love doing them. There's no video vacation with me. Yeah, I, th I think we're we're trying to get you on uh, an on an invitational. The, the one in January, I think, coming up. Yeah, they were talking about it. Um, I want to do it. Hopefully, we can find someone else to do it. Uh, Lovato, yeah. troll at this one. Lovato, he wants happy Lovato. But I I called him out after the other thing. And he goes, I, oh, think yeah. that, I think that dude asked for a picture with me. Yeah. I totally did. I'm such a fan. Yeah. But, uh, no, I was like, I, I, I think remember that. Roll. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Now I remember that. Yeah, I, I heard you guys talking about that this week too. Yeah. Um, so yeah, he's coming here. He's gonna come in here again. He's a friend of the, of of us. Yeah, he was here. so nice. Like yeah. he's a picture, no problem. He's cool and stuff guy. like that. He was, he was real nice. You can tell. I mean, a lot of people say such great things about him. Then he comes through. You can tell he just hands the way he handles yeah. himself and everything. No, that's definitely one of the guys that you look up to. Like being one of the first Americans to win worlds. Yeah. Like how do you not look up to that guy? Yeah, what is, what is his full resume that, that is, is so impressive? Can you uh, expand on that? He's the first uh, American to win Worlds in Brazil. Yeah, I think he did right? it twice. Twice, okay. So, BJ won it first. Uh, but Lovato was the first American, like, to win it twice. And I think he was the first American to win, like, a Brazilian national, too. 
Yeah. Like, he had a bunch yeah. of, like, the big titles. When yeah, when Americans really weren't doing Yeah, like, he was the sport. American name in the sport before there were American names in the sport. Like, he was, like, Jeff Glover and those guys, like, back in that time. Like, even before that, kind of. Like, he's a beast. Who were, who were those Americans that, like, could you expand on that? Like, of, of Glover, Lovato, uh, Eddie's in that class, I guess, considering he beat uh, uh, a yeah. yeah, Eddie's in that class. Um, there's lots of guys, man. Because, like, you even have those guys that weren't even really jiu-jitsu guys that were doing jiu-jitsu stuff. Like, your Mark Kerr's and stuff like that. Oh, your Jeff Munson's. But, yeah, Lovato, Lovato's just a monster. And what? He's been a monster for a long time. He's still yeah. a champ now, dude. But he, that's the thing is, like, if you if you want to be the best guy in the world, the only way to improve your jiu-jitsu that level is to test it against those kind of guys. Yeah. And that's yeah. that's what I see all these things as. Like, I, I really don't care about the competition aspect of it. Like, yeah, I'm a competitive guy, but I think the ability to learn from it, from it, and make yourself better, uh, is what really like is the beauty in it. Well, that's a long play, too. That's how you become the best guy. You continue Plus, you, to... you get, like, a peek into those guys' psyche. Like, mm -hmm. when you, you roll with somebody, you can kind of, like, read them a little bit. At, at your level? Hell I, yeah. I mean, at, at all levels. At all levels, but at your level, they're like, not Like, even in the base level, just, like, the way people move forward, like, their aggression, the way they, like, think about how you're going to do something to them. Like, yeah, it's definitely a little bit sharper, higher up. Right. But you can tell a lot by the way people think, the way people move in their games. Like, you have your people that care for you, run forward, float on top of stuff, and then you have, like, your very, like, reserved people, and then you have, like, your aggressive wrestlers that are, like, headstrong through life. Yeah. Great people. Yeah. So, it's interesting. Now, uh, are there any other dream matchups you have out there? I really want to do a match with Craig Jones. If you would stop selling leg lock DVDs for a little bit and allow me to play with his feet. Uh, <laughs> fuck Craig Jones. <laughs> And then, um, so there, there's three right there. Lovato, you need that match with Gordon Ryan, and you need that match with Craig Jones. So there's the three. Yeah, I think the, well, I, I would like a match with Keenan, too. I think that'd be fun. Keenan Cornelius. Once he gets his pink eye cleared up, I guess. Yeah, what was he, what was he out for? Uh, he had really bad pink eye. They had some, like, viral pink eye in New York. <coughs> the rats, or? I don't know. <laughs> Who knows, dude? I mean, they need to find better strip clubs, I guess. <laughs> they need, Yes. They're let the quality of the strippers has gone down in New York as the quality of the rat yeah. has been, uh, the size of the like, rat I mean, has been. Uh, like, I get it. If you're in the Brazilian park line, uh, all for you, but like, <laughs> rinse your face off after. Rinse your face off after. <laughs> um, and then, uh, so what, what seminars do you have coming up? You have Ohio. Uh, uh, <laughs> that'll be posted on my Instagram. I have a few in Ohio, I think, coming up. Uh, I've been working with Emil Fisher. Hopefully I'll have one in Cleveland and then one in like mid-Ohio. And then I'll be in Newark, Ohio on the 20th. So. 20th of uh, uh, October? Yeah, so it's that next Sunday. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, I get kind of lost in my dates with all the traveling and stuff. Like, staying at hotels will take it out of you. It's Sunday. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. So, yeah, yeah, I mean, you've got to be at a point right now where it's just like you're waking up looking at a different roof all, uh, all the time. Dude, I, I've been in three different time zones in like a week. A little over a week. Yeah. Like, I've gone from like. 30 degree weather that feels like 15 to uh, 90 degree weather and everything in between. Yeah. Like my sinuses have been all over the place. I've been on six different airplanes. <laughs> like it's it's a little crazy. Uh, and then just like constant training and doing stuff. Like even when I was in Canada, like I was driving or I was doing stuff, I was teaching or I was filming. Like there's no slowdown at all. And that's what people like, People don't realize it's like you think you're gonna become successful at something and like life's gonna slow down it doesn't it, it speeds up it's like you take a bunch of Adderall and you just go. yeah yeah <laughs> uh, and, yeah there's uh, no resting the more successful you get oh no yeah. rest is something like I think it was like 50 cent that said that rest is for somebody who's broke yeah like, I, I don't get the rest I think that I think that is the book but I think that fits my personality man like I have trouble sitting still like, I fidget all the time like, I get up and pace like, I think that's why I like doing jiu-jitsu, is that it constantly gives me something to do and think about and move with. Uh, and that's, like, I was telling you, like, a lot of people feel like it feeds into, like, some sort of, like, almost mental disorder being good at, like, jiu-jitsu or anything. You almost need, like, that slight degree of, like, autism or ability to cut yourself out from everything else. So that way you're, you can sacrifice the things that need to be sacrificed to be good at something. Yeah, because there's only there's only X number of spots. Like in, in the NFL, there's about. Well, and you've got to be a little out of your mind to do it too. Yeah, 
Yeah. Like, what guy's gonna be like, yeah, I'm not gonna go out with all like these pretty girls one night, because I wanna go train tomorrow. Yeah. Like, I'm gonna wake up early and train. I'm not gonna eat Or maybe like, some, yeah. maybe you had to go out and like hang out with some people till like 3 a.m. and you're like, I'm tired, I'm gonna wake up at 4.30 in the morning in an hour and work out to hit my normal schedule. And you just do it anyway. Yeah. Like, you gotta, you gotta have that ability to just cut everything else out. Like, maybe you have some friends that aren't in line with what you're doing. And you cut like, them out. Yeah, no. Yeah. Dude, if I could just show you, like, through my social media, like, how many people that I used to talk to so much, and then, like, as soon as, like, I was, like, jujitsu is the only thing that matters, like, I just stopped talking to them. And, like, I still love these people, but yeah. I probably haven't talked to them in years. Yeah. It's like, if you saw them again, and, like, you ran into each other, and, like, it wasn't out of your way, you'd be like, yeah, like, it's great to see you. Like, we ran into each other at, like, you know, uh, Chipotle, and we shared a... A, a burrito. Oh yeah, right? no. Like it'd be cool. Like that. It'd be great to see you. One of my friends, Melissa, is like a. She became a stewardess, and uh, a flight attendant, whatever. And <laughs> I don't know the proper terminology. Yeah, there. don't worry about. I'm a dumb jujitsu guy. Don't yeah, mind me. Yeah. Uh, but like I run into her every once in a while. She flies around the cities. We have lunch. I say hi. She asks me how I'm doing, and then we go about our days. Yeah. And it's like once every like three to four months, I might see her. Yeah, that's nice. Yeah, to just run into run into an old friend at the airport. Yeah, when, when like, it's on your me, schedule. Yeah, and like she knew me when I was like a kid, like because I've been doing jujitsu since I was like fifteen. So, that, that's a crazy part of it. Like, like I remember getting picked up from high school like to go to jujitsu class by like my coach and stuff. Yeah. What did you? Uh, what what got you into it again? <coughs> my mom said I needed something to keep me out of trouble. Were I'm you getting in trouble? trouble in, in, uh, in high school. Like, you get in trouble in school? There. Not really like in school, like just throwing out partying and stuff like yeah. that. Like, I, I was kind of a regressive kid too, so I was getting some fights and stuff. Uh, but then like I started, I actually came into this gym to do boxing because my dad's neighbor at the time was a boxing coach. His name is Paul Delgado, a really good boxing coach. He was actually a decent boxer too. Uh, you know, getting Parkinson's and stuff, though. real side story. But I came in to do boxing and I liked boxing and I enjoyed boxing. And, and stuff. I'd already played like a little bit of freshman football, so I was in good shape. Yeah. And uh, I watched my buddies doing a jiu-jitsu class, and we ended up talking shit about like some UFC stuff. And I was, I think it was, it was a Matt Hughes fight or something. And basically, I picked the fight because I like I knew what was gonna happen. So afterwards, he thought convinced me to come in and try out a jiu-jitsu class. He's like, "Hey man, you should come try it out." And I was like, "I don't know." And then I had gone to this party and gotten in trouble. I got caught by the cops or something. And my mom's like, all right, you gotta do something. Like, you can't just be sitting around, like, hanging out with a bunch of losers and stuff. Like, you gotta do something. So I went to a jiu-jitsu class. And the first class I ever took was with Papa Alessandro, who's now, like, ranked number five in UFC. Like, awesome yeah, he's been stuff. he's been at the top for, like, five years. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, no, I helped Papa Al train for Uriah Favor back when I was at WEC. He beat the shit out of me. <laughs> and I was, like, a teenager. I used to be, like, child abuse. Yeah. Uh... <laughs> But yeah, so I came in, I trained, and I fell in love with it. And then I came, I, like I took a noon class, came back, took a night class. First day? I, yeah. Yeah, you were hooked right away? Yeah. Uh, I just have like a personality like that where I'm like, okay, I'm gonna do something. Yeah. I just do it. Uh, but yeah, so I, like, I, I started going, and then I decided I wanted to fight MMA. And so I started doing, I was only doing no gi. And then one of the coaches was like, you have to do gi. I was like, all right, I don't have a gi, so he gave me a gi. So I had this like tattered Krugan gi that was like blue, didn't smell great, but like I fucking loved it because they did it to me. And uh, I just kept training and everything like that. And I remember like during the summer I would come and I would train like three, four, five times a day, and I realized I was like the only person doing that. So I'm like, I just don't have anything else, and I'm awkward, so I don't like know how to talk to people well. So this makes it a little easier. This gives me so like that. That's what you mean when you were saying. Uh, I don't know if you said it on this or prior, but like in a jujitsu setting, like you're like that's where you're most comfortable, and that's where you. Oh yeah, of, no. If you put me on a mat, I can talk to anybody. We can talk about anything. Like in normal settings, like if you're not talking about jujitsu or like something that I'm. Or I know, or I know that you can talk about jujitsu. I don't feel as comfortable because well, like you, like, like you said, you can talk about yeah, anything on the like, mat. I almost become more like speculative of people when they it's not a jujitsu setting. Yeah, where I'm like I'm judging like. Like, should I trust this person? Like, yeah, yeah. Kind of thing? Like, I don't, I don't know. And again, maybe that just feeds to like my own mental disorders. But but that's what I was saying about you're like you're like I can talk to you anything on the map, but just like you've just became comfortable in the that actual environment. 
but oh, it's yeah. a place where you feel most comfortable as well. Well, I think part of it's also like, because during like those teenage years, like those are your, like your awkward years, right? Yeah. Where you don't realize like you have these like misconceptions of like who you are and what your voice is. And, like, you have no idea what you're doing about anything. Yeah. 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 And jujitsu just gives you like this actualization to like realize like what you need to do to be better. Like a lot of people always say like jujitsu is a very humbling thing and points out all your flaws, but it allows you to address your flaws. I think that's like what made me fall in love with jujitsu. Is it's like this constant work in progress, like my own psyche or anything I'm working on. It's like it's never finished. Yeah, it's yeah. my own piece of art. Yeah, it's something you're continuously working on. And then in pointing out the flaws, it's like over time you just taking it at a base level. Like if you're eating like shit, you see the results of that. If you're oh, sleeping yeah. like shit, or if you're not. And that's the thing is like jujitsu will teach you those lessons along the way. Like, do you want to not take your conditioning serious and go do a match? Yeah. Like, have fun with that. Have fun yeah. feeling like you're drowning. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> That's a great feeling. Yeah, uh, you, you don't want to run? Like, make sure, like, maybe you didn't work some, like, overtime stuff. Cool, you're in overtime. Somebody, like, made it through some of your leg locks or some stuff. Have fun with that. Like, yeah. see how your body reacts to, like, you not doing it all the time. Yeah. So, like, it takes everything. Like, it, that's, it's really just that simple. Like, you just have to do freaking everything. Like you've seen what I've been here. Anytime anybody wants to train, I'm like, sure, what do you want to do? Yeah. They're like, you want to work out? All right, I'm working out. Mm-hmm. Like, and that's the other thing too, is like, I'm not gonna let someone outwork me. Like if someone out in the gym outworks me, that means there's someone else out there outworking me twice as hard. Yeah. So like, if you're gonna do something, I'm gonna do it too. And I'm probably gonna do twice as much or twice as heavy as you. Yeah. And that's yeah. the mentality I take into it. That's the problem. And it's gonna suck, and I, but I'm just gonna grit through it and do it. Like I worked out the other day with my thumb, like yeah. barely able to move. I, I, I hear you on that because that's a problem. I have the, the same thought that you have about if someone in here is working out working me, then there's someone else out there. So you're yeah. always like. Well, the idea is you also have to be intelligent with it, right? Yeah, yeah. So it's not just like they're outworking you or something like that. Like you have to realize that maybe this isn't the best thing for me to do right now, so I can do something else. Yeah. But like, uh, I don't know if you follow college wrestling, but like, like Yanni Dimakahalas, how we say his name is. Yeah. Like, he made a point. He's like, even if you're injured, he's like, there's always something yeah. you can do to make yourself better. And I think that's something that people don't do. A lot of people, like, just take time off. They're like, oh, my toe hurts. I need three weeks. Yeah. Like, that's three weeks you'll never get back. That's the way I view everything in life. Like, every day, I'm like, that's something I'll never get back. I think that's part of the reason why I'm so antsy all the time. Like, when I go in my hotel room at, like, 7 o'clock and, like, I'm, nobody's doing anything, I'm like, I don't know what to do. Because <laughs> I'm like, I will never get this back. I, I, got, so I, I, got, I got that something. text last night. You were like, what are yeah, you doing? Yeah, like, what are you doing? Like, I was like, dude, I, uh, what, do you, what do you mean? It's <laughs> 7 o'clock on a Sunday. And I was like, dude, I, like, I want to go train. I need to go out. I want to go do something. I need to do something. Yeah, I was like, I'll train. I'll, I'll do whatever. You know, yeah. watch football. <laughs> yeah. But what is, your, what is your training schedule looking like at that 4.30? What are you doing in strength and conditioning? So I actually do like two strength and conditioning sessions on average, like when I'm back home. Uh, so I'll do a 4.30 and I'll either do like a functional training then or I'll do a strength training. And then I alternate it when I go to like the like 11 o'clock one that I do. But the, the morning one is usually like heavy lifting where I'll do like dumbbell press or like deadlifts or something along those lines. And then like the, the midday one is usually about like functional stuff. Like I'll do sandbags. Like I might like carry a 50 pound sandbag like I'm down like 25 foot steps or something yeah. like that. Or, uh, Something that's not like... Or like a lot of farmer's carries, like I like using the steel club and just yeah. grabbing the ball side of it. And I'll do farmer's carries with that to make my grip stronger. Uh, like, like I said, anything to make me better at jujitsu. That's how my life revolves. It's just anything to make me better. Like if it makes my life better, cool. That's that's an added bonus. But whatever makes me better at jujitsu. Yeah, just everything. Are you doing yoga at all? Uh, I don't really do like traditional yoga. Like, Are you stretching I, a lot? I stretch a lot, yeah. Because we are talking like you're, you're sore all the time. Yeah. Well, that's it. Like, I try to do like at least one recovery thing a week. So like, I have a really good massage therapist back in Atlanta. Her name's Krista Tim. She, she works at the Atlanta Hub Club, but she was the wrestler for the women's U.S. World Team and Olympic Team oh, for she wrestling. Got strong hands. Oh, dude, she fucking makes me cry. Uh, but <laughs> it's like it's there's nothing better. Like yeah. honestly, that's probably the reason why I keep going. Like even when I was here, like Mary worked on my thumb and like definitely helped because I rolled my thumb gnarly. Yeah. Um, so it, like it, having those recovery through, aspects makes it so much better. Like you guys have the physical training here. Yeah. Like that's a huge tool. Like every recovery thing you have, you guys have the sauna. Like that's what makes this place like a destination to come train. Um, it's got everything. It's it's pretty. Yeah. Pretty incredible. 
Yeah, and all the people here are great too. So like, yeah. like if someone's a massage therapist or like a physical therapist, like they'll have advice for you and tell you stuff too. So that's really cool. Uh, but yeah, like recovery stuff's important. Like I do cryo. Like I feel like something like there's like a lot of lactic acid or not built up in my arms. I do cryo. Uh, I do a chiropractor every once in a while too, because like I have like bones that'll pop out and stuff. <laughs> my wrists are pretty gnarly from years of gi jujitsu, probably. Did you start in the gi? Uh, I actually started no gi started and then gi. went gi heavy for a while. Right, like they, they and told then you I no realized gi. that there wasn't any money in the gi early on. I remember I did my like I did a no gi division at a Copa America, which is like a Florida-based company, but they would come up. The guy that owns it, Ross Kellen, is a, a dear friend of mine. Like. Uh, gave me my first super fights, but I remember after I did my weight division for no gi because no one showed up for the gi division, and I killed like three guys in like probably the span of a minute total. And he was like, "You should do the absolute division also." And I was like, "I, I don't have the money. I was a broke, yeah. broke kid." Yeah. And he goes, "He goes, no, no, I'll cover your entrance." He's like, "Go in there," and I tapped everyone there in like thirty seconds each. And one of them was like a pro MMA fighter. His name is Joe Elmore. Crazy dude, he had won a bunch of stuff, really good MMA fighter. Uh, and he's like, he didn't tap, he just screamed. So he like said that, so we both had that. And then he introduced me to like one of my first real sponsors, which was like uh, Grips. So Yeah, the, the finger tape? No, 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 the clothing brand. Okay, okay. Uh, like I, I was sponsored by like little small companies here and there, but like Grips was like the first big one. And uh, the Grips took care of me pretty well, gave me some good exposure. And I had that super fight with Joe and I tapped him in like 30 seconds. And so they gave me another super fight and I faced this kid, Ian Murray, uh, who had won this ESPN tournament that- An ESPN tournament? Yeah, Jiu -Jitsu Brandon Quick did it. It was like this, this ESPN tournament. I was part of it too, I was still cutting to 170. Like, it almost killed me to do it. Like, and I, like, I popped this guy's leg, he screamed, he stopped the match and like, there was some like weird stuff and I thought it was restart and he started in a leg lock and he popped my iron. But, it was some craziness. But afterwards, Ian Murray had won that tournament. Like, he beat Roberto Menez, who was there, uh, and he had won it. So the I young, he, the older one? The older Roberto Menez? No. Senior? No, the junior one. He was, like, he was like 16 at the time, I think. He's and good, huh? He's super serious. Uh, he's a really nice kid, has a really good work ethic. I don't think his no-game game is there yet, but his D-game is super strong. I watched him. Yeah. Like, he has a really good IBGJF no-G game. I just don't think he has the leg lock yet. If he ever gets him, like, he's going to be a monster. Uh, but yeah, so Ian won that, and I faced him, and I Z-locked him real fast. So, and then this kind of took off from there. I started doing the Kakudos, faced Brandon. I'm not sure which one happened first, uh, but I'd won a few Kakudo absolutes also. That's what really started drawing me into the absolute tournaments. Uh, funny story, so with the Copas that they did in, in uh, Georgia, they would do an absolute, and every time they would do the absolute, I'd do it. And there was like two or three times in a row where I won it. Like, I'd have four matches and it would all equal like less than a minute. And so like people would stop showing up, or like when I'd sign up, they'd stop signing up. So they had to cancel doing the uh, absolute divisions at the Copas in Georgia. For you, a while. you had this problem like for years now. Like, of, of like getting fights, huh? Well, because like the local guys would start to see me, and then like I'd tap everybody. And it was like you'd only ever get like one or two black belts, maybe, in like an absolute division back in the day. So like yeah. that one it was really cool. Uh, but yeah, no, I've had a problem for a while. Like, I did some of like the competitive scene like locally. Like, I was like one of the first jujitsu super pro jujitsu super fights they did an MMA show in, in Georgia. We did it, like center stage. I was with an organization called NFC, and that was cool. But I remember even like in doing that, like being the uh, the young American black belt, like it was not looked upon well to like try to offer like a bigger name guy like a match against you. Be like, hey, you want to roll with me on NFC? And they'd be like, oh, you fucking challenge me, blah blah. Like. Dude, I'm trying to get you money for something you pay to do. <laughs> uh, Wait, how long are you in your black belt? Shit, man. Like five years? Five years. Yeah. It's been a minute. Have you, has it been like, how have you felt like this is, you, like you said, you've been at the, you're, this is the best you've kind of felt as a jujitsu athlete. Like, you, you feel like you've made crazy progress in these last five. Like, what? How do you feel like, like becoming a black belt is like starting all over again? Okay. Like unless you're one of these freaks, like phenomenal people that come yeah. out of nowhere from like yeah. the brown belt to black belt divisions. Like the thing is, black belt, there's no ceiling. You yeah. Guys that have been monsters for a decade and are yeah. still monsters, like your Lovatos or like 
your Cabrinhas, your Hoffman Mendeses, and then come in and murder people. So like getting to the level where you're like, you're like, okay, this is all I can do. Like just to be competitive, like you have to give up everything. Yeah. And then like to actually be successful and like continue to be successful, like the amount of sacrifice it takes, like if you told most people that started Jiu Jitsu, they were like, oh, I wanna be a world champion. And then you showed them all the stuff they had to do to be a world champion, they would cry and leave. Yeah. Cause like you gotta deal with poverty cause they don't pay you for that shit. Yeah. Like you gotta deal with feeling terrible every day because you do. <laughs> yeah. You just get comfortable with like these uncomfortable scenarios. But I think that adds some of the beauty to it all. Like adversity is what breeds the opportunity for success. Like every adversity is a success, success waiting to happen. So like if you just take it like an obstacle and like everything's a challenge that you have to overcome, it makes it easier. Yeah. And I mean, you've been meeting all these challenges lately. Yeah, man. I mean, when was your like? What I mean? What, like, how do you how like? Cause I feel like you've experienced some kind of jump in your game over these last few years, right? With, with your confidence that you're feeling right now. Yeah, I mean, it's just different was there, stages was there of life. A moment. I don't know. You go through these ebbs and flows of growth, right? Yeah. And there's things and opportunities that spark it. And I think I just had a lot of opportunity for sparks of, to like improve my game in the last year or so. Like I, I had won the honor invitational, which showed me like. Like, hey, bro, you are really at this level. You, like, yeah. you might be one of the best in the world if you if you pursue it. Uh, and then you'll have these matches that were like hard, where it was like you you performed really well. You just didn't finish. Like the Nick Rod match. Like I looked great for the entire regulation. Just couldn't get the finish in an overtime. He got me because I wasn't strong enough to break his leg. So that was one of those things where I was like, all right, I have to be a stronger human being yeah. if I'm going to fight these guys that are really. And that's what drove you a lot of this lifting lately. Oh yeah, actually, yeah. Like I said, that and that Kobe Bryant quote. We were talking about waking up early. Uh, and like, you just have to adopt that as part of your belief system. Like, everything I do will make me better. Is everything I'm doing going to make me a champion? Yeah. Will this interfere with it at all? And that, that's just what I do. I run it through that filter. Like, will this make me successful? Yeah. Also, will this make me happy? <laughs> yeah. That's a big part of it too. Is like, the right kind of mindset going into stuff makes a big difference. Like. If you have a happy, calm mind, like I used to tell my students, like a calm mind is a dangerous mind because it means you're thinking clear. So as clear and calm as I can keep my head is the best I'm going to perform because it's like how I am in the gym. And if I can roll how I am in the gym then I murder everything, then rolling a competition is nothing. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's been clear. Um, I, I had a feeling that that Ana Invitational win was a big, big victory for you. Yeah, it was a cool one, but I kind of knew it was coming. Like I you had other stuff coming. like beforehand where I was like, like I've, I've murdered high level people. Like I faced Dutch Johnson twice, tapped him twice with Helix. Like, and he's ranked pound for pound number five, which like he's worked really hard at, but like I've never been on a pound for pound rank. And I've tapped pound a lot for, of people. Pound for pound number five in the world? Uh, I think it's like maybe it's ultra heavyweights. Okay. Either way. Like, yeah. Serious. But the thing is, is like that's part of the thing about like coming up in the South is there just wasn't that much like news there for Jiu Jitsu. Like there's a hot bed of Jiu Jitsu there, like it's where the Alliance HQ was, Roberto Travin's there. Uh, you don't hear about a lot, of, a lot of stuff in the Southeast though. You, well, your strategy now. Yeah. I mean, Chase Hanna did well at that BJJ Fanatic tournament. Shout out to the homie. Uh, but I, there's like, there's but like even the like California Texas, shows. Like Texas there's... is just starting to come up. Yeah. Like Cody Steele, like attack it, like Jordan Holly. Yeah. Like there was all these new markets of jujitsu. Right? I was on Verbal Tap and I talked about this. I was like, everyone keeps waiting for the next wave from California, the next wave from New York. They don't realize like there is a hot bed of jujitsu between Florida to Texas and the whole South. Like it's just gonna knock the game over. And I think, and I think it's the I think it's the athlete mindset of it too. Is like in the South, you're like, we do athletics. Yeah. That's what we do. Yeah. Like wrestlers take the real like grappling athletes up north. We don't know how to have that in the South. So as we start to get them in jujitsu, like you're gonna see some craziness. And we don't have cold weather to deal with. So people are outside running mountains and yeah. stuff in the middle yeah. of the day. <laughs> yeah, it's the same thing that I experienced being from New Jersey and playing baseball teams from Florida and from Texas in tournaments. Cause we had a pretty serious baseball team. So we, you know, but then it was just like, we played these, they, they'd usually be AAU teams and we were kind of a town based AAU team. So it may have had some advantages, but man, you just knew man, these kids play baseball all year. Yeah, we played from we played from the end of March, you know, or March, and it was cold until August. Well, I mean, even think about it. Think about rolling the cold. It's not a comfortable thing to do. Like yeah. your body doesn't take to it well. 
So having the ability to roll in weather where it's like 70 degrees, like in yeah. the winter time or 60 degrees, yeah. is a lot different than rolling in like negative 32 degrees. Yeah, and I think to what you're saying too about being able to run, and how, and then the other thing is I think that jujitsu is part of the thing that excites me about jujitsu is that the same issue we see with football is yeah. that this can create that mental fortitude that football can create without the consequences of football, the head trauma consequences. Yeah. I think a lot more of the mental fortitude came from, from wrestling, for me, honestly. For you, like, yeah. Like, football gave yeah. me the sense of confidence to carry. Yeah. Like, the fake it till you make it thing, like, that yeah. slider you just keep with you. Yeah. Like, even if you're unsure yeah. of it, you're like, fuck it, I'm gonna be fine. Yeah. Uh, Swaggers, for sure. You get that from football. Yeah. You get, I mean, you can't. But, get like, that wrestling just teaches football. you grind. Yeah. Wrestling teaches you to be tough. What, I, what I'm saying about that is that I think there are a lot of parents out there that are like, oh, my kid's not gonna play football, but he, he'll do this. He'll yeah. wrestle and he'll do jujitsu now. So there's going to be a lot more kids that have spent time. Oh, with I them. agree with you too, and I think like yeah. with the UFC stuff, and not only that is you see all these stories of like kids getting bullied and like choking a kid out, and like, yeah. it's fine, but like it looks really cool in a YouTube video. I think it'll drive a lot of parents to do it, like that viral sensationalism of it. Yeah, uh, yeah, because it just it becomes such an, and it doesn't look as violent. It just looks like wow, that kid doesn't even look like an asshole, like beating up that other kid. Like he yeah. didn't hurt him. He just put the kid to sleep, and now that bully looks like the asshole. Yeah, pretty much. You know, yeah. like that bully went to sleep and, and like he didn't get beat up or nothing. Like he now has to like look at that guy who didn't take advantage, like didn't beat the shit out of him while he was asleep and be like, uh, like have to show him respect. Yeah. You know, there, it, it's, I mean, parents from a self-defense standpoint, there's, there, there's nothing better. Yeah, definitely. I mean, just the ability to like control somebody, like, especially like someone who doesn't know jujitsu at all, it makes it so easy. Imagine. Yeah. Imagine what you would do to someone in, who tried to p do something to you on the street that had an injury. Uh, I was it like, just, just in my time in jiu because I've been doing it so long, like, I've been in a few fights, like, since I've been doing it, and the ability to, like, throw someone at guillotine or just mount someone and hold them down yeah. is so good <laughs> for, like, the self-defense aspect. Yeah. Like, if I can just maintain your wrist and, like, hold you and mount, like, you can't do anything. If you do, I'm going to elbow you. Uh, but, like, I can keep you from hurting me, and I can keep you from hurting me. Yeah, yeah. So. Yeah, man. Yeah, well, t uh, tell everyone where to find you. Find me on Quentin Rosenzweig on Instagram. Can you spell that out for them? Q-U-E-N-T-I-N-R-O-S-E-N-Z-W-E-I-G. And is that everything? Uh, where else would you want to send them? Uh, I'll be on Rockfin here soon. Uh, keep an eye out for that. It's a subscription site. You'll be able to get all my content. Also, watch out. I should have a DVD in the works here soon. So watch out for my DVD. Throw some leg lock knowledge at all of you. Hell yeah. Uh, besides that, I'll be in Ohio. Uh, for the King of the Mat tournament, then I'll be down in Florida for Joshua Duke, my manager's wedding. Uh, I should be teaching some seminars down there. And then I'll be in Boston the weekend of the 15th during the BJJ Finance Center tournament, and hopefully I get some seminars up there. 15th of November? Of, yeah, I got a lot of Boston friends and, and family up there. Like my mom lives up in Boston, so I get to go see my mom and my sister uh, and hopefully do some seminars. Usually I teach them private, so I'm up there. And you're getting a lot of privates when you, when you go on all these places. Oh, places, everywhere. Right? <laughs> Uh, yeah. I'll tell you, man, it's a kill him with a smile strategy. Yeah. Like, just be really nice, come in, try to murder as many people as you can, as nicely as you can. And then when they ask you to show them stuff, just be cool about it and show them. Yeah. Yeah. Well, well thank you for stopping by 10, 10 PATX Radio. Um, you'll be, you're, you're leaving tomorrow. And, tomorrow night, um, I'm out. And then I'm uh, in Atlanta for two days. So I'll be teaching some privates. And then I'm up to Ohio. Hell yeah. It's been great having you. So thank Thanks, you man. for coming.